I'm here today to talk to you about the proposals around the civil service compensation scheme. Uh, in effect, what that is, is the, uh, the redundancy arrangements for civil servants uh, and how they affect us in either compulsory or redundancy uh, situations. Now, the first thing I'd like to just uh, touch on is that I think it's important when we discuss this issue uh, to acknowledge that um, over the last 15 years, there's been uh, quite a breakup of terms and conditions and pay arrangements for civil servants. I myself, I'm a, an EO in the Department of Work and Pensions at the DWP. I've been there for about 25 years. And uh, I can remember, as I suspect probably some people here can remember, when as a civil servant, we had our own pay, uh, uh, one pay arrangement, one grading system, and one national uh, conditions of service. And over the years, particularly on pay and conditions of service, uh, that's been broken up into departments, and they've been allowed to set up their own pay arrangements uh, and their own uh, conditions of service arrangements. There still remains, however, key things that affect us as civil servants, irrespective of which department we work in. One of those is pensions, and I think you can probably remember a couple of years ago, we had to run um, a, a very uh, fierce campaign in defence of civil service pensions, where the government proposed to end the final salary pension scheme and to raise the pension age from 60 to 65. That campaign uh, went across all departments and NDPBs uh, because we're all still under the same pension arrangement. The civil service compensation scheme is another of the few issues that remain uh, uh, affected as all the civil servants across departments. And I think one of the things why it's important to acknowledge that is because if you look back to the pensions issue, one of the key aspects I think in this able to defend our final salary pension and retain the pension age at 60 was the fact that it wasn't just um, 70 odd thousand members in DWP campaigning or 20 odd thousand members in the land registry campaigning, but it was 320,000 members across PCS who were campaigning in a united way uh, um, on one particular issue. And the reason I refer to that is because we need to take heart from the pensions campaign in relation to how we defend ourselves against these proposals. Because when I run through the detail of those in a moment, um, I'm sure you'll agree, as the union believes, that they're absolutely despicable proposals that will mean a huge de detriment to thousands of civil servants and people who have accrued rights over a number of years that the government uh, and employer now believes that they can just wipe out uh, with a single act uh, in, in, in Parliament. So, the <coughs> Civil Service Compensation Scheme, as I've said, is in effect the redundancy payment scheme for the civil service and what we call non-departmental public bodies. And basically, if you're covered by the Civil Service Pension Scheme, then you're covered by the Civil Service Compensation Scheme. Now, the, the scheme also provides uh, benefits for people who unfortunately have to leave their, empo <coughs> excuse me, their employment through what we call limited efficiency. And that can be either issues around health or issues around uh, performance. Now, at the moment, the proposals aren't, you know, aren't intended to affect people who leave through limited efficiency. But <coughs> they have made it clear that should these proposals go ahead, then that will be the next stage in terms of how they would like to implement them. I think it's important also to recognise, and I think it's something that may be particularly uh, uh, pertinent to yourselves, facing uh, the possible uh, privatisation in, in the future. But one of the things that we are um, incredibly concerned about with these proposals is not only do they face, uh, mean that members will face a huge detriment, but also that if making people redundant is cheaper, then it could extend the present privatisation and outsourcing proposals across the civil service. At the moment, we've got a very good, what we call a jobs protocol agreement in place, that means in effect that if you're threatened by compulsory redundancy, then there is a requirement uh, uh, for you to be considered for vacancies in other 
government departments. And that's been very successful over the last number of years in ensuring that people who were threatened by compulsory redundancy have actually remained as civil servants uh, within uh, another government department. And we believe that the redundancy terms have been a key factor in making that jobs protocol agreement effective. But of course, if it then is cheaper to make people redundant, then you can see a whole new scenario developing, whereas redundancy is a lot easier to do, and the threat of compulsory redundancy in particular uh, will be one that will be um, extended. Now, there's a bit of technical uh, ish, uh, detail around the proposals that it is important uh, uh, for us to work through so that you've got a really good understanding of the nature of the threat that, that faces us and how the union uh, is, is defending uh, uh, members against these proposals and what we want you to do in order to help us in, in this campaign. The first thing I think it's important to note is that uh, the, uh, any changes to our compensational redundancy arrangements have to be done through an Act of Parliament. It's not the same as many employers where they can negotiate with the unions a set of arrangements or changes to terms and conditions. Because of the nature of our employment as civil servants, any changes to our pension or redundancy arrangements has to go through, uh, through an Act of Parliament. And I'll come on to why that's important later when I talk about what the union is doing in order to try and prevent these changes uh, going ahead. So what's the actual detail of the proposals? Well, the proposal at the moment will sweep away all of the current arrangements that we believe have stood the test of time over a number of decades and ones which we've campaigned for and, and, and negotiated over uh, a number of decades. I also think it's worth us noting the reason why the uh, redundancy arrangements in the civil service are called the civil service compensation arrangements is because they were initially brought in in recognition of the fact that the work that civil servants do is unique in many cases to the type of department that they work in. So for example, when I first started work in an unemployment benefit office, I learned how to decide if people were entitled to unemployment benefit and to decide if they were entitled to that if they, if they lost their job. It's not necessarily a skill that you can go into a private company and, 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 and exercise. It's not like you a wages clerk or a credit controller or a personnel manager or something like that. And so it was compensation. If you lost your job, it was compensation for the fact that the job that civil servants do, in many cases, is almost unique to the department that they work in. And if they lose that job through redundancy, then they need to be compensated for the fact that it's not as easy in many cases as someone who's trained in a more generic uh, role that they can transfer to, to another uh, employer. And so the compensation scheme recognised that the payments that it paid out had to reflect that sort of 